Hello Penguin Arts, I'm the Baby Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Kerbal Rising. Now, last episode we launched an invasion of Sonus, a Kerbin-like planet with 1.3 Gs of surface gravity and it has proved a little bit of a tough nut to crack because we sent our fighter aircraft down to try and gain air superiority over the main continent and promptly had them blown out of the sky by Liberator's upgraded versions of the Firestorm, that terrifying fighter aircraft that we last encountered back on Gaia. So, this episode we are having a renewed offensive. We have the ISS Trojan in low orbit over Sonus and I did try, but I just cannot come up with a better fighter aircraft than the Alara Mark II. It is an exceptional aircraft, but the Liberator is just godlike. So I've just taken a bit of a Soviet approach to things and just sent in more of them. <laughs> if you can't beat them with quality, beat them with quantity. So we're sending in an extra Alara Mark II from the ISS Spirit of Drados. The Liberator's taking off there. A little bit of an explosion as they took off. Clearly they were quite eager to get into the air and smashed into each other, but they didn't do any actual damage to each other. They just knocked off like a radiator or something. And so, here we go. Now the advantage of having an extra fighter is that even if each of the Liberators gets on the tails of two of my Alaras, we'll at least have one of them free to pick at least one of those Liberators off while they're hunting down our wingmen. So at least one of our Alaras at any point in time should have a pretty clear shot on one of the Liberators and this should give us a pretty decisive advantage in this battle. The Liberator and the Alara Mark II, they've always been almost evenly matched. The difference in their capabilities is really subtle but when you're using antimatter engines traveling at the speeds, velocities and just crazy g-forces uh, that these aircraft have to endure, the slightest advantage uh, just proves to be utterly, utterly decisive. So having an extra Alara should make things swing in our favor and sure enough the Liberator is showing their exceptional um, aerodynamics by immediately getting on the tails of one of our Alaras and then on the Alara trying to hunt it down though we pull some evasive maneuvers we promptly have a wing stripped off and then we lose our first aircraft as it is blown straight out of the sky very unfortunate but we do have our wingman on the tail of the Alara which just took it out of the sky and it's sticking on the tail of this Liberator as much as it can. There is a very, very subtle difference between the maneuverabilities of these two aircraft. So once one aircraft gets on the tail of another one, it's really, really difficult to shake them, no matter whether it's a Liberator or an Alara. And now, we've kind of got the situation that we were really hoping for. Both of the Liberators are trying to hunt down our second Alara, and they're both leaving themselves pretty uh, open targets here. Now, we're kind of in a race against time. We have two aircraft to take out and the Alara only has a single 20mm cannon. It's just a way of saving points so that we can fit two of them on a carrier. However, the Liberator has a distinct advantage in the fact that it has two 20mm Vulcan cannons. So it has twice the firepower and it's trying to take on half the number of aircraft. So we're just crossing our fingers hoping to hell that our Alara can hold on and sure enough it does with the first Liberator being blown clean out of the sky, ripping itself apart. Since we're traveling almost a kilometer per second over the surface, we just need our wingman to hold in there for a little bit longer, try and stay just on the edge of its weapons range, and throw some light maneuvering to try and keep it as stationary as possible, yet not leave itself an open target. Just so we can line up enough fire on this second Liberator to blow it out of the sky. We get some glancing hits, but then it lines itself up for the killing blow on our Alara, leaves itself stationary for a little bit too long. We get a few more hits and we knock the second Liberator clear out of the sky, blowing it to pieces. We did lose one of our wingmen and of course one of our aircraft was significantly damaged, but we now have control over the air airspace on Sonus. And so with our newfound air superiority, we are going to use the remaining five points of planetary forces we have on the ISS Spirit of Drados to send down a tank to deal with a military installation on the second continent across this rather large ocean. Sonus is a massive planet. Um, just because its surface gravity is 30% larger um, doesn't mean that uh, 
it's actually it, its radius is 30 percent larger. I think the, the radius itself might um, almost be twice as large uh, as that of Gaia or Kerbin. So uh, I need to have a look at the actual statistics for it. But it is a huge planet, um, and dogfighting on it and even flying any kind of aircraft whatsoever, um, you really do have to remind yourself all the time that the gravity is 30% stronger. Your aircraft try to fall towards the ground, you have to maintain much higher uh, angle of attack and much higher velocities in order to actually generate lift on a world such as this. But we're just entering the atmosphere with our Mercury class dropship with a single Ison class medium tank on board. We do actually undershoot so we have to fly for a little while, but sure enough after uh, a little bit of flight time we are heading towards the enemy base with our Mercury dropship and we're going to try and drop ourselves down about 25 kilometers out so that they can't get too many shots on us. We have three enemy vehicles to take down and it looks like they're exactly the same as the ones we faced on Kibos. They're those nasty spider walker thingies. One of them has got two 30mm cannons and then the other two have got 75mm. So 3v1. It's kind of the opposite of the, uh, of the dogfight here. Uh, we're massively outnumbered but my hope is we have a much, much better tank here, so we should do much, much better. We, of course, have the Ison medium tank, which uses the 105mm dual cannon, which is much more accurate than those 75mm chain guns. It doesn't fire as often. Um, its rate of fire is actually significantly lower, but it does a lot more damage when it hits, uh, gets through a lot more armor, and as I said, it is much, much more accurate since it's not swiveling... 75 millimeter barrels and just churning out um, shells as fast as it physically can. Uh, it also produces, I think it produces less recoil, but I'm not entirely sure on that. Recoil doesn't really matter so much on this planet though, because it is of course um, so much larger with 30% extra gravity. You can actually see there with the sunset, we are significantly further away from the sun. Uh, we're right on the edge of the outer solar system here, and we are of course soon going to be heading out into the outer planets. Uh, the realm of Olum and Jewel, the gas planets of the uh, very extreme edges of the solar system. But just as we're getting to the top of this hill, we have a little bit of a problem. Um, for some reason, we can't drive up the hill, and after a while I realise it's because we're out of electric charge. Uh, this is a pretty light tank normally, but since the gravity is so much stronger, we're actually uh, running out of electric charge trying to drag it up the hill because of course it weighs 30% more than it would normally on this world so our, uh, our tracks are really struggling to lift its weight all the way up this hill perhaps that's why the uh, why the enemy tanks use some kind of spider legs or some kind of walker setup perhaps it's it's easier than using tracked vehicles on a, on a planet with gravity as high as this but uh, immediately as we head over the top of the mountain we're just hit by a huge like volley of fire, 30 millimeters and of course 75 millimeters. But the 75 millimeters are profoundly more inaccurate than our 105 millimeters. So we're getting some pretty effective fire down, and we're staying moving. We're trying to avoid as much fire as we can. The 30 millimeters against our medium armor are going to be pretty much ineffective, especially at this kind of range. The 75 millimeters could do us some real damage, but they're just not getting enough consistent hits on us, and we're getting quite a lot of pretty damaging hits on the enemy craft. Unfortunately, the craft are of course suspended quite high up because they've got these massive legs. So the center of mass, and hence where our guns are actually aiming, is a little bit below where the cockpit is. So what we're effectively having to do is blast all of the legs off of these tanks before we can actually hit the cockpit and knock them out of the battle. But they only have, uh, I believe, 100 millimeters of armor all over, whereas we have 150 millimeters of armor. Uh, and we also have much bigger caliber guns, as I said, so we're going to be cutting through their armor much, much easier uh, than they're going to be getting through ours. And as I said, we're more accurate, and we're trying to keep moving, try and throw off their aim as much as possible, which is kind of difficult with the higher gravity. You can see we're blasting off as many legs as we can uh, on these enemy tanks. I don't know if you'd even classify them as tanks when they have uh, giant, creepy spider legs. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. I guess just armoured fighting vehicle, we'll just refer to it as. Um, we do try and keep moving, as I said, but with the engine struggling as much as it is, we can't actually go up the hill for very long. So I end up going backwards, just trying to keep the tank moving as much as possible uh, to try and avoid the incoming hail of pretty much overwhelming fire. But soon enough, 
we take out the 75mm cannon mounted on the first enemy armoured fighting vehicle creepy spider thingamabob and then it isn't long before it takes a few more 105mm rounds right to the cockpit and then promptly explodes. So now it is only 2v1. Looking rather uh, rather awesome there actually as <laughs> the spider walker sort of tumbles over. We're getting sort of Battle of Hoth vibes even though we're not obviously taking on giant AT-ATs with with snow speed it's really not remotely similar to the Battle of Hoth but still <laughs> that's that's what it reminded me of we're trying to balance the amount of fire we're getting so as you see um, as our armor panels are taking fire their hit points are obviously decreasing so we're trying to maneuver our tanks so that we take an equal amount of fire on each and every one of those armor panels so that we can stay in the fight as long as possible and this is working pretty damn well as you see a 30 millimeters just bouncing clean off this armor um, but the 75s are doing a significant amount of damage but with us maneuvering around so that we're showing a different uh, face of our armor every single minute we're essentially minimizing the amount of significant damage that we're taking and despite losing of course the Drados Imperium flag which is very sad to see we do manage to take out the second tank and now all that is left is the tank with the 30 millimeter cannons so all we need to do now is close the distance put down some more fire and get taking out this final tank however the one thing we can't keep maneuvering so that it isn't being hit is the turret of the tank. That 105mm turret, although it has got 150mm of armor like everything else, it has taken a severe beating and after a few more salvos from that 30mm chain gun, we only put out a few more rounds and then the turret of our Ison class tank is actually taken out. So we do manage to of course knock out a few more legs, do a little bit more damage but it's not much longer until our Ison class actually loses its turret and we're actually completely unable to fight anymore. So we do what any rational person would do and we charge the enemy position with no method of destroying them whatsoever. I mean the aim here was essentially just to hit it at full speed because we have knocked out most of its legs. I think it only has three remaining so if we did hit it at full speed we might have been able to knock it over but unfortunately our armor has simply taken too much damage and the tank manages to take us out. Okay four legs left and it was also on a podium so was that a complete waste of life? Possibly. But let's not dwell on that too long. We have a new carrier heading off to Sonus, the ISS Victory. And it is going to bring with it a Callisto class tactical bomber. Now using that, we're going to take out that final tank and hopefully have enough missiles left to deal with the very last stronghold left on Sonus, a naval base protected by a single surface frigate. So we launch our Callisto class and we get it heading down to the surface. Now, it was always the plan to launch another carrier sometime soon, uh, but I did really want to defeat Sonus in this first turn because we're actually combining two turns into one this turn because we have a lot of colonization of course of Sonus and Kibos and we also have to build up our fleet before we head out to Olum uh, and the outer solar system. So I really did want to finish off Sonus in this first turn so that we could colonize it this turn and have a lot more points to play with next turn and because of that this is why I decided to launch the ISS Victory a little bit earlier than the original plan. But we're going to need three carriers at least uh, if we head out to Olum because of course olum has got five moons I think? Four or five? No it's four. Um, most of which have atmospheres and there's going to be quite a significant surface complement on each of those. So uh, we're going to need quite a lot of planetary craft to be conquering uh, the moons around that brown dwarf. So it's going to come in helpful in the long run and of course Conquering Sonus and colonizing it as early as possible will only give us more points to play with. So we enter pretty accurately actually, I was pretty proud of that. Uh, our re-entry, well I say re-entry, we are entering with, for, for the first time with this Callisto. Uh, but our atmospheric entry brings us pretty much right on top of the enemy tank. So all we have to do is line up our laser pod targeting camera thingamabob and then get our laser guided maverick missiles at the ready. Now this thing doesn't have a huge amount of armor so a single maverick is 
pretty powerful and should be enough to take it out. The only problem is it's suspended up on those four legs. So if we don't hit the cockpit exactly, we hit the ground underneath it, we might knock out the legs but leave the cockpit intact. But we're just going to launch one missile at a time. It only has 30 millimeters and they're semi-decent for air defense, but they're usually not accurate enough to hit a high-speed missile. Uh, for that sort of thing, you either need, well, lasers or you need uh, 20 millimeter turrets to do that sort of job. So we launch our first missile and it heads straight in and pretty much without fault it hits the enemy tank. It looks like it's still intact though and the weapon manager is still reading operational. So what we're going to do is we're going to swing down and see if it is still actually capable of firing. We're going to activate our few little 50 cal turrets although I think I really should replace them because they're yeah, they're just utterly useless. I think we should maybe put some 20mm turrets on this. Two 20mm Vulcans would probably be a better idea. The intention with these 50 cals was uh, was essentially for missile defense, but um, yeah, they're really quite useless. I think we'll just add some 20mm or maybe a 30mm for ground strafing. Uh, I think that would be quite a lot more useful. But uh, unfortunately, it turns out, no, the uh, yep, yeah, that tank is still very much operational. It fires quite a few rounds at us, a few pinging off the wings. This aircraft doesn't have any armor, so that was a big risk, but thankfully we managed to get the Callisto out of its weapons range uh, using those antimatter powered engines, and there we go, we're out of harm's way. So we only have six missiles here, and we really need to be saving as many as possible for that enemy naval vessel, but there's very little we can do. We can't risk a 50 cal run on something that has two 30 millimeter cannons. So we're gonna launch yet another Maverick missile, and since its legs have been blown off, this should be a pretty easy kill. And sure enough, we completely obliterate it. So now what we have to do is head over to the naval base, which is the other continent, so across that massive ocean. That ocean of which I think is like half the width of like <laughs> half the circumference of uh, of Kerbin, I think. Um, just that distance. This is such a massive planet, uh, so it's going to take a little bit of time. And uh, once we get there, we're going to have to be as economical as possible with our Maverick missiles because, as I said, we only have four left. And uh, yeah, the reason why we have such a limited armament is because, of course. Um, we can only spend 10 points uh, on planetary craft when they're mounted on a normal carrier. We will of course implement super carriers later on in the series, but right now they're far too expensive. Uh, and because of that, since I wanted to have the 50 cal missile defense grid on the Callisto, uh, we can only mount 6 missiles, which is kind of annoying. Um, I think in the future I will just remove the 50 cals entirely, or mount a single turret on maybe for the ground strafing. Um, but just having more missiles is always going to be more useful. We haven't used those 50 cals once in all the times we've used the Callisto, but having more missiles I think would have been helpful in a lot of situations, especially this one. But uh, what we're going to do is, what we pretty much always do, is target the bridge of the enemy naval vessel. So we can knock out its ability to fight. We won't be sinking it, but if we obliterate the entire deck, set it all ablaze, blow up all of its weaponry and take out its command, we should be able to get rid of it. And four Maverick missiles should be enough to do that. It does actually launch an intercept missile at us here. Uh, and it's at this point I realized I forgot to put countermeasures on the Callisto, uh, which is a little bit awkward. But thankfully, we obliterate the ground uh, <laughs> radar station on the, um, on the actual uh, naval vessel. And I don't know if the Pack 3 intercept missile is a fire and forget. I think it might actually be guided by ground-based radar, so by taking out the ship we basically destroyed its guidance system and as such it was no longer able to hunt us down. I think otherwise that Pack 3 intercept missile may well have hit us, but we managed to uh, knock out the naval vessel before it could either launch any more or guide it in to its target. And uh, we do shoot it up with some 50 cals, but it's pretty dead. I'm fairly certain. So, we've managed to take out the ground forces on Sonus and we can now move in with a colonial flotilla and colonize Sonus and its moon Kibos, giving us four more points to play with. And with our newfound riches from the surface of Sonus and Sojos, we launch a all new form of warship. This 
is the ISS Fortitude, a Venus-class destroyer. Yes, our very first destroyer. Uh, I was going for a bit of a functional aesthetic. I think it turned out quite nice, actually. Um, I don't know. I had <laughs> differing opinions on the Discord as to whether it was a cool, functional sort of look or whether it was just really ugly. Or whether it looked like a fish. I don't think it looks much like a fish anymore since I mounted those massive hydrogen tanks on it. Um, yeah, kind of a... Lesson learned from the Pluto-class Corvette, don't make weak hydrogen tanks uh, an integral part of the structure of your ship, just mount them on the side. So we link up the ISS Fortitude with a newly refitted Crimson Fleet, as you see those Mars classes looking rather snazzy now with their new engines and their new point defence lasers, which we spent a few points on, replacing those useless 50 cals. We'll be adding three more ships to the Crimson Fleet before we head out to Illum next turn. However, on the other side of the solar system, back around Moho, the ISS Anubis has been tracking a new arrival. A Cyclops-class frigate deployed by the United Federation of Nebos. Now, it hasn't got any torpedoes of its own, and it has pretty lackluster point defences. So, we drop cloak on the ISS Anubis, and we prepare to send it a welcoming greeting. Clearly, a warship as advanced as this represents a pretty significant threat to the inner solar system and the stability and safety of the Imperium. So we need to take this thing out. As far as I'm concerned, this could be a pretty significant investment on behalf of the Federation. Taking it out could secure our borders for many months or possibly even years to come. And we're not going to pass up on this opportunity. The enemy vessel detects our presence almost immediately after we drop cloak and they orient to get their anti-ship lasers ready to deal with our incoming barrage of torpedoes. However, the problem with using anti-ship lasers as point defense is that, first of all, although they are much more powerful, they you're much slower, so they find it much harder to track fast-moving projectiles such as torpedoes. And the even bigger problem is that they overheat. So once they've been firing for a pretty short amount of time, they have to cool down. Now, once we're traveling uh, towards the enemy vessel, it do actually open up with the railgun early on, but it's not quite able to hit us. And then the laser opens up, and although it does manage to completely obliterate our first torpedo, the lasers then have to cool down. So although our second torpedo just narrowly misses, our third torpedo flies straight and true. Boom! We strike the side of the ship. Now, unfortunately, the ship was hit by the remains of our first torpedo and knocked slightly off kilter. And while it was adjusting itself with its RCS, it moved, causing our second torpedo to miss and our third torpedo to only just glance it. However, that glancing hit actually did far more damage than we ever could have hoped for. Although it wasn't enough explosive to actually significantly damage the hull, we've completely wrecked the internals of this frigate. We've taken out the main reactor, knocked out the weapon manager, I think destroyed all of its ammunition stores and a huge portion of its fuel as well. It's pretty much adrift and completely unable to fight anymore. So we close the distance with the Anubis to half a kilometer and at this range lasers just utterly obliterate the Cyclops class frigate, carving it into many small superheated chunks and completely removing it from the system. Look at that, isn't it beautiful? The ISS Anubis tearing it limb from limb into a small but rather beautiful debris field. However, we're not going to stick around. The ISS Anubis's presence is certainly going to be known now and uh, we're out of torpedoes. We have no way of uh, doing any kind of long range combat. Uh, a few point defense lasers are certainly not going to be enough against a sophisticated Nebian battle fleet. So we're going to be heading back to Drados to get ourselves refitted, possibly to head out on some future missions in the next episode. But that has been Kerbal Rising episode 8. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I do hope you have enjoyed. Next episode we'll be heading out to Olum and potentially dealing with some kind of Nebian counter-attack around Scorch. However, that episode won't be arriving for quite some time because Tape, he's off in Ireland doing 
job training stuff. So although I, <laughs> I'm now having my uh, YouTube upload schedule return to normal because my exams are finished, Tate will not be uploading any Kerbal Rising for at least two months or so. Uh, so sorry about that, there's nothing we can do about it, it's just life. Uh, and I'll be going on holiday and stuff over the summer as well, so don't expect any more Kerbal Rising for quite some more time, probably until mid-August. Uh, at the absolute earliest, but uh, in the meantime, maybe you can go back and watch Fall of Kerbin or something, I don't know. And KSB Endurance will still be continuing on my channel, so you can watch that in the meantime. Thank you for watching everyone, I do hope you have enjoyed, and I will see you all next time.